Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to speak in such a oak clad room. Um, I'm gonna start right at the very start uh, and uh, maybe define what agriculture is. Uh, and to me, agriculture is the ability through the application of science and technology for the few to feed the many. Uh, and if we look at the last 100 years, what does that mean? Well, it means we've gone from a situation where we had two and a half million people working on our farms here in the UK, and we are now in a situation where around half a million people work full-time on farms in the UK. So that represents now just 1% of our population, down from 5% 100 years ago. And if you take this backwards all the way to sort of Roman times, you will find figures of around 75 to 80% of people of the population would have been engaged in farming here in the UK. So it's a, a continuum. And the key is, you know, it is a continuum. It's always changing, it's always adapting, it's always adopting new technology and new science. So if some of the things I talk about seem a bit far-fetched or a bit you know, crazy, think about where we are today and how far-fetched and crazy that might have seemed 100 years ago. So how has that 5% dropped to 1% in the last 100 years? Well largely thanks to mechanization, the uh, adoption and development of the modern day tractor based around the diesel combustion engine. Uh, here you can see a very, very funky modern one. Uh, if you sat in this tractor and you hadn't sat in one before, you would not be able to drive it. This is driven by a series of button presses and clicks and twists. It does not resemble your gear, gearbox or clutch or anything you might recognize from a car whatsoever if you get in the cab of this tractor. Um, what else is going on in this picture is in siling of bales, so wrapping grass in plastic in order to create food for, for winter animal feed. So all these sorts of technologies that are wrapped up in this picture have developed in the last 100 years, allowing that one person to do the work of, of many more. Other things we've adopted, rightly or wrongly, and we might want to debate it, but largely what has allowed us to feed a population that has continued to grow is the adoption of uh, ag chemicals and fertilizers. Again, moving forwards, we might want to reconsider these choices, but in the last 100 years, these have been critical in the way in which we've been able to feed more people with less. And we get beautiful, clean crops that, that don't have any weeds or pests or competition in them, which gives us great yields. And you can see that in this graph here that, can sh that shows a linear yield increase uh, all the way through time, more or less. We'll come back to that in a bit, thanks to these technologies. What are the challenges to come? And the two images on this, this slide are, are nothing new to anyone in this room and nothing revolutionary. But the point is, as the population grows and as the climate changes, farmers will not only have to cope with ch climate change, will not only have to cope with the fact that temperatures are, are more variable, we get colder winters, hotter summers or whatever, or more flooding or et cetera, we are actually also, as agriculturalists and farmers, expected to mitigate them. We're expected to catch carbon, develop our soils, and actually mitigate and reduce climate change as well as cope with it. So we are well and truly, as agriculturalists, on the front line uh, as we drive for net zero. So how are we going to do that in a, from a, technological, uh, a technology point of view? Well, there's this concept called, uh, a management concept called precision farming. And precision farming is all about precision. It's all about doing the right thing at the right time in the right place and in the right way. Subdividing our fields into smaller and smaller areas where we observe variation, measure variation, and then manage variation within our fields more and more precisely in order to reduce the waste in, with our inputs, such as fertilizers and ag chem. So only putting inputs exactly where they need to be, shaving all the waste and driving yields whilst reducing our overheads and our emissions. And this isn't a new concept. This concept was sort of first coined precision farming around, around about 1992 is when this phrase first comes into to, to, to sort of the, the language of agriculture. Uh, and at the moment, just for those who don't know, we're, we're somewhere in the middle of this journey. We're, we're not whole fields anymore. We're certainly subfields, but we may be not quite singular plant level management just yet, although I'll probably come back to that as well. So what technology has enabled us to do this precision farming? Well, uh, GNS, GNSS uh, positioning, uh, Global Navigation Satellite Systems, and I'm not going to try and explain them too much because I imagine there's people in this room who understand this stuff far more than I do, but largely what happens with GPS, as I'll colloquially call it because it just rolls off the tongue easier, is that we receive clock pulses down from space, and as users, we 
we, we receive clock pulses, we work out a time delay from the time that that clock pulse was sent to when it arrived, that gives us a distance to the satellite, and once we know the distance to several satellites, we can position ourselves on the Earth. Now that's great, other than the fact that those signals get refracted and bent and bounced and warped. And that allows us only really to get around about meter accuracy on your device that's in your pocket. Now if I want to go farming and I want to farm at a plant by plant level, I need better than this. So in agriculture, what we have developed, uh, and it's used other places too, but agriculture has driven this, is differential GPS systems. So this is systems where we use known base locations. We real time continually calculate the GPS position at that base station. And therefore, if I, if I know I'm here as a mast, but I calculate that I'm over here, I know that there's a meter of error. And then I real time send that error to a tractor or a machine in a field, and that allows that tractor in the field to correct itself. The more locally you do this, the better that correction can be, and we can get correction that is down to as little as 10 millimeter accurate. And that isn't just 10 millimeter accurate that I know where I am today, that is repeatable month on month, year on year, continually, maybe not accounting for continental drift if you wanna go as far as that. But I can put a 10p on the ground today and I can find it next year using differential GPS systems, which allows us to plant by plant uh, farm. What have we done with that? Well, we've made tractors steer themselves with people still sat in the cab. So here's a tractor, it's got a receiver on the tractor, it's got a receiver on the seed drill, and it can compensate for the fact that it's trying to slide down the hill, this machine. So it's not only accounting for the fact the tractor's sliding, but it's also accounting for the fact that the implement on the back is sliding too, and it can put in steering uh, inputs that keep this tractor dead straight and covering the whole field without any overlap, without any misses, the key to getting optimum productivity. We've also used it to automatically turn on and off our sprayers or fertilizer spreaders so we can cut down the waste. And by moving to auto steer, you generally say you'll get five to 10% savings in your inputs. And by moving the next step to sort of auto section systems, we will get another five to 10% savings on top of that again. So again, this is all eaten away at how much farmers are putting into the landscape, which is obviously all good. Some other funky stuff we've done is harness machine vision. And this is very basic uh, uh, color segmentation. And this, but, uh, this product goes through the field and you can see it identifies lettuces and it basically wants to kill everything that isn't a lettuce. And it stirs up the soil and destroys all the weeds. Now, this is quite a cool bit of implement, quite a cool bit of equipment, but it kind of doesn't seem that surprising today. But it might seem surprising if I told you that that product has been on the market for 16 or 17 years now. Okay, so machine vision has been on farms doing useful work for 17 years. In the livestock sector, we've got agricultural, uh, we've got uh, milking robots, robots that, that, that can milk cows, make a fairly, uh, a, a job that has some fairly unsociable hours, a little bit more social. If we go back to that full sustainability picture, we have to think about people as well as profit and as well as environment. And, and certainly agricultural robots in the dairy environment have made that job nicer for small family farms who've adopted the technology. We've got feeding robots, that's at the top corner. This is a machine that's a big sort of tub. It takes different feed inputs from the other things. It mixes it all up and it goes and feeds cattle all by itself so a farmer doesn't have to. And we've strapped pedometers or Fitbits for cows onto cow's legs. And we can see if that cow has got a, um, a limp or an ailment. And we can also track to see uh, if it has uh, early signs of various diseases and things. So this technology is not only in, in the sort of uh, crop space, which is where I mostly work, but is also in livestock as well. Okay, so what are the problems with mechanization? Uh, I've already told you that we've got a reduced rural labor force, and this has driven us to drive our tractors to be bigger and bigger and bigger. We've got limited time windows. Uh, and that, again, is because our farms have generally got bigger. We still only have two weeks to drill a crop or two weeks to harvest a crop. So we need bigger machines to make that possible. We've got one-upmanship. Farmers love looking over the hedge at the farm next door. If the farm next door's got a bigger, shiny tractor, I need to buy a bigger, shiny tractor too, so I can talk about it down the pub. That sounds really flippant, but it's completely true. 
My brother fa falls for that trick all the time. It's a mar, you know, the guys here from big companies in front of me love this. They can sell tractors by just putting a bit more chrome on them. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the problem with this though, is that this, this, is a, this is a combine harvester generating what they call a yield map. So it's like a topographic map that tells you where the yield in the field was high, where it was low. But the problem is this is marketing lies and it actually looks like a barcode. And the, the resolution of our data is limited by the width of the, the header in this situation. So as that machine's got bigger, the resolution and the precision has got worse, okay? So when precision farming first happened, when the first yield maps were on combines, the combine header was six meters wide. This combine here could be a 12 meter header, I think, and now it's not uncommon to see a 14 meter header here in the UK. So you've halved the amount of data we're capturing from our fields in the era of precision. Those big machines also compact our soils. This is an extreme example where we've got full crop failure on the headland of a field. But if we go across our fields, we have major soil health issues. And that compaction, if we go back to this yield graph, has caused a plateau in yield ever since the year 2000. So our yields have failed to rise since the year 2000. And if we go back to the sort of climate agenda, compaction is also not very good for sequestering carbon, building up uh, biodiversity within our soils either. So we want to try and get rid of that. And what's caused it? Really big tractors. So an alternative future, if we didn't need bums on seats, we didn't need people to drive our tractors, would be to develop uh, autonomous systems that don't necessarily have to look the same size shape. We could repackage our agricultural machines if we embraced automation. So we could go really small, be ultimately more precise, be lighter on the soil, better for compaction. We would have swarms of small vehicles if we repackaged them into these little vehicles that were cheap, we could have loads of them. So we'd retain the amount of output we could achieve. We'd retain the jobs as well. We just might make the job a bit more interesting, exciting, engaging for a younger generation to look after these machines. And from, a gen, uh, from the point of view of me, who is a developer of these systems, or has been a developer of these systems, small vehicles are intrinsically safer. If I automate the huge 30-ton tractor on the previous page and something goes wrong, I've got a major problem on my hands. There's not a lot that stops a 30-ton tractor if it's going AWOL. If I automate the thing like a vacuum cleaner, then it will stop when it gets to the side of the field and hits the hedge. So that's a benefit too. To put some numbers on this, if we think about repackaging our agriculture, if I plough a field, I'll move about 1,900 tonnes of soil per hectare, continually moving soil. If I just got some sort of drill bit mechanism, drilled a hole, injected a seed, I could move as little as 12 tonnes a hectare of soil. It's 150 times that soil movement. I'd like to think that might mean that there's a big energy reduction to be had too. And maybe it would open the door for electrification, which is a bit of a struggle with the amount of material we're currently moving. So those are great academic ideas, and they're academic ideas that have been swilling around since the 90s, 2000s, and, and they were ideas that I really bought into. But what I didn't buy into was the image of that red blob robot, because I'm a farm. I'm a farmer's son. I've come from agriculture. And it didn't seem relatable to me. And when I used to go and give this talk, it didn't seem relatable to any farmers I spoke to. So the idea with Hands Free Hectare was to show that we could farm autonomously today. And in fact, not today, back in 2016 when this project took place. So we wanted to automate existing small-scale farm equipment with open source technology to grow the world's first hectare of autonomous crop. And as I say, this was back in 2016, and the, it was a really small team, really small budget, but we were trying to change the perspective of all those farmers who said, not in my lifetime is there going to be an autonomous machine on my farm, because that was the attitude in 2016. So this is Hands Free Hector. As I say, we started in October 16. By March 2017, we had tractor in the field drilling a crop. So it's a six-month development process, faster than anyone I've ever known who have gone and spoke to about autonomous systems, zero to in the field doing a job in six months. And that's all thanks to open source technology that we harnessed. And you can see there our crop is growing and you can see that it's not particularly good. It's got lots of misses and whatever else in it. But we achieved this with three people, small budget, a couple of hundred thousand pounds in a single year. We grew a crop fully autonomously. Uh, da -da 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 -da. You can see our tractor driving, wandering its way around the field, not particularly brilliant. But nonetheless, we took that crop all the way to harvest. 
Oh, oh, not yet. I should know. I do this twice a week. I should know how long the video is. There, you, there it is, Harvest. 2017, at this point, Britain, the UK, Harper Adams in Shropshire was the world's first people to grow a crop entirely using autonomous machines. Thanks to us. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there he goes. Um, the, uh, I'm going to skip a whole load of work. We did it again. We got some extra funding because we made a big noise and we got politicians to come and look at it and we... You know, we did all sorts of stuff. I was going to say we wrote papers. We didn't. That was the one thing we didn't do. I'm a rubbish academic. But I did lots of outreach, and we changed perceptives of UK farmers, and we got some more funding to do some more stuff. And skipping a few years, quite literally, we eventually got funding to do what we call a hands-free farm. So rather than one square flat field that was easy to do and didn't really represent normal farms, I'll go a bit quicker. I'm probably running out of time. Uh, we got 35 hectares of land and five fields, and they were all traditional shape sizes, random fields, fields with telegraph poles and manhole covers, and we developed a system that could cope with all these things by teaming up with a few more partners. I'll show you what that looks like now. So this is one of our larger fields. This is a combine harvest. You can see how straight it drives and how few misses are now in the field after a few years of development. So this is, uh, this is our tractor, and, and I will run this through a little bit longer just because of the fact that this, this, this situation, we've got a tractor unloading from a combine. Everyone said, how are you going to do that? Because when it gets to the end of the field, they'll crash when they turn the corner. And after you know, several weeks of sort of on and off scratching our heads about this, the sort of hands-free method was to try and break down every problem and make it simpler. We decided the simplest way to stop them crashing at the end of the field is just put some space between them. So rather than do funky simultaneous turning, we just put 50 meters between the two machines and then they don't crash. Surprise, surprise. So, you know, there's always a simple solution for a complicated problem if you look for it. So you can see the tracks comes to the end of the field, it'll turn, I will skip on because we don't have much time. Um, what else has come from this? Well, we've done some economic analysis. The blue line in the top graph represents a conventional farm. As the farm gets bigger, the tractor gets bigger, which is notified by the, the numbers on the graph, and the cost of production comes down. So this is a demonstration of economies of scale. The bigger the farm, the more profitable the farm. The orange line represents a farm where you use my system, and as the farm gets bigger, you duplicate the system up. And what we can do by driving down the capital expenditure and by reducing the physical man hours attached to farming, we can drive down the cost of production. And what's really critical about this graph is we can drive down the cost of production at small scale farms. So we can make small scale farms that are currently unprofitable. A, a ton of wheat is currently worth about 180 pounds. If it costs you 170 to grow it, you're not making any money. That's a big old waste of time. So we can make small scale farms profitable by moving to this sort of system. We've also done further analysis. I won't talk through the graph particularly in depth, but essentially it shows that this is also more profitable on smaller irregular shaped fields too where we've normally cut field boundaries. So what we're looking to do is can we utilize that, 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 that fact that smaller scale, more niche, more precise, can we make farms and fields that mo hold multiple crops, that get away from monocrop farming, that, that allow us to have synergistic benefits between one crop and another? And rather than making this really sci-fi, we've just thought, could we use our system to grow a stripy field, a strip crop field in Shropshire? So we did that. We've got two metre combine, we've got a two metre seed drill, a two metre combine, uh, and a two metre ability to spray. So last year we grew a stripy field. And it, we only did this as a sort of could we do it last year, but now we have done it. I, we're doing it again with a load of uh, agronomists and biologists studying the effects of if we put more than one crop in a field, do we get biodiversity gains from this? Do we get synergistic gains? Do we get nitrogen fixing plants feeding nitrogen using plants and stuff like that? So can we not only farm autonomously, can we farm autonomously to farm better? Uh, some of the stuff coming through, if it will play, are things like using AI to train algorithms to identify green on green weeds. So this is a machine that's seeing dock leaves within grass and then just spot spraying the dock leaves. This means we can cut chemical application in a field by about 90% if we're only spot spraying the, the, the dock leaf rather than the whole field. We've got drones, and if we went to Southeast Asia, you'd see drones spraying large areas of land. And at the moment, we're sort of going through, is that okay or not here in the UK? Is that biologically okay? Is it sustainable? But as a first point of call, 
this has been licensed, this machine on the side, which has got a sort of horizontal lance, and this has been, been licensed to spray um, for foliage that's growing up like embankments on railways and things like that. So in a very particular use case where we're making a job a hell of a lot safer than a human doing it, this has been allowed. And there is moves to move towards sort of drone spraying. Two more slides. If I look to the major companies who, when I engaged with them in 2015, all would tell me, we're not interested until the year 2030, it's not happening until the year 2030, have all started to move. So John Deere weren't interested until 2030, that was director level people telling me that, not interested until 2030 kit. Last year in January 2022, January 2022, announced they were gonna sell autonomous tractors. They started shipping them this summer. So if you're an American farmer, you can buy an autonomous, very large John Deere tractor. Uh, CNH, who we're going to hear from in a minute, uh, purchased a company called Raven, who are a big precision farming company. They had previously far purchased two startup companies making autonomous systems. So these are two of the world's biggest companies in ag getting into autonomous farming today. We've got startups coming through all over the place. This one here I like to call like the gateway drug. It's called an ag exceed. It's like a, a tractor without a cab, essentially. They're starting to sell those in the UK. I, I think it's too big. It's too heavy. It's all the things I don't really like but it will get people on the journey to automation. Alphabet, Google, the, the owner of Google, has an autonomous farming division. Who knew? And finally, this is really important. So this is a farm droid. This is a farm droid. It's a seeding and weeding robot. And it goes back to that point about reimagining the size, scale, form factor of farming. Because this machine drives slowly, and because it, it plants seeds and then it weeds around those seeds and only does about 800 meters an hour, so it takes days to get across a field rather than hours, but that doesn't matter because there's no one sat on it, this machine is able to run fully via solar power, okay? So this is a solar power machine that's growing high value crops. It remembers where every seed is, it weeds around every seed, and it can organically grow a crop through the sunlight alone. There you go. And they're in field today. There's about 20 of them in the UK. And that's where I'll end with a vision of the future that I helped develop with the Royal Academy of Engineering.